Okay, back to part two, uh, Arts of Rome, uh, starting to look more in detail at the building methods or construction methods of the Romans. Um, the Greek or the Romans, of course, adopt a lot of the architectural forms of the Greeks. You probably noticed that when we were looking at the forum. Uh, and as I said before, one of their main um, structural uh, materials is concrete, which allowed them to do some things that the Greeks couldn't do, uh, including construct things much more quickly than the Greeks could have. And the other addition is, although they didn't invent it, um, and the basic idea of the Roman arch has been around since corbel vaulting, which we saw a few examples of uh, going back to um, New Grange in Ireland or um, the burial tombs of the Mycenaeans. It's been around for a while, but they're the ones who really perfect it, and they use it for everything. They use it both to create uh, buildings, they use it, some of you know, to create huge aqueducts that could bring water from miles away into town. The Romans, of course, uh, perfected modern plumbing. Uh, they loved their baths, so they'd, they'd have kind of hot springs bring in water from afar uh, so as to fill those baths. And of course, they use it for just about everything else in between. The basic idea of the Roman arch you see here in three different forms. Um, the one on the far right, we won't really go into. It's just to give you an idea of how these things get expanded. Well over here on the left, you see the basic idea. Um, you know, you've got two posts basically, but they are headed with an arch form that because uh, it is, it's set up in the way that it is, the thrust, all the weight of everything up above it comes down onto the keystone, which holds it or locks it all together, and is pushed out onto the, um, the outer part of the arch itself. So it's to displace uh, the weight up above it. And this is much more efficient in its, in its ability to kind of span large spaces than a post and lentil system. If you put a bunch of basically Roman arches together, you get a barrel fault, which you see here in the middle. And then if you uh, set these at, at perpendic uh, perpendicular right angles to one another, as we'll see in Christian churches, you can build what's known as a groin vault and span large areas that way. Um, I didn't put it on this one, but you can probably imagine that if you just spread it in uh, all the way around, 360, the basic idea of the Roman arch can be used to create domes. Which leads us to this building. So one of the most famous buildings constructed in Roman times is the Pantheon in Rome, which was first created by Marcus Agrippa. Uh, it burned down. And then later on, the same uh, building was reconstructed by Hadrian. Uh, Hadrian was a, an emperor who loved the Greeks and actually kind of fashioned himself as a Greek philosopher. And um, he was also an architect who came up with the design for this form. Now, what you're seeing here today is a little bit, um, well, it's not quite accurate in that because of the buildup of modern Rome, one of the key features of Roman, ancient Roman architecture is that they set their buildings up on a high podium. So you'd have to walk upstairs to get to the entry level, whereas the Greeks are just, you know, two or three steps up. They'd have these much bigger and you don't see that here. But what the, the reason I bring that up is that when you would actually approach this building, you couldn't see the what we can see here, which is the giant dome shape behind it. It's a, uh, a typical Roman facade where they take basically a Greek Templar structure with the uh, columns here. These are primarily Corinthian columns made out of stylized acanthus leaves. It's something we didn't see in Roman times, or I'm sorry, in Greek times, but um, they were used there as well. In what's known as an octostyle, meaning it's got eight columns across the front and it goes three and a half deep. Um, but the big difference between this and Greek architecture is that the area up here that would have otherwise held sculpture for Romans was just covered with stone or used to have a dedicatory um, 
um, you know, verbiage here. As we see here, Hadrian's actually devoted this to Marcus Agrippa rather than himself. It's a, it's a way for him to show honor to the original architect of this form. So you'd walk up this space. The Pantheon itself, Pan means all. So Pantheon, Theo means God, is means, uh, you know, a temple to all of the gods. And it was a functioning temple, but it was also, you know, religion in Roman times was used politically. And so saying that it's a, a temple to all the gods is a way of saying it's open to everyone uh, and we respect all the gods. But honestly, the way that this seems to have functioned is as a kind of place that ha that this leader, Hadrian, could bring foreign dignitaries and show them the splendor of, of Greece, or I'm sorry, of Rome at this time. So, you know, that's from the top, you'll see the part that you can't see very well there, and you couldn't see at all originally, which is this gigantic kind of drum shape with a huge dome, the biggest dome that had ever been created up to this point. And it will remain the biggest dome all the way until the Byzantine Empire. Um, and it's it's quite a feat of engineering here. So let's kind of move our way in, into this. If you look at a, a, a reconstruction drawing of this, you can where one side has been taken out, you can see that you would enter into this porch space through some columns and probably some statuary into the gigantic space of a wide open interior with sculptures all around the outside and beautiful different types of stone all around here and the dome space hovering up above you. The proportions are just like the Greeks based upon perfect ratios. So here's a cross section of the dome itself where you see that the height of the dome is exactly twice the diameter of the dome so that if you put a perfect sphere inside, it would fit perfectly within this dome. And I could take you through every single little ratio that is in this work, but uh, or in this architecture, but believe me, everything is set up as a series of proportions in relation to other forms. When you get inside of this, one of the kind of most miraculous things that's not going to be something I can tell you much about. You'll have to hopefully get a trip to Rome and experience this at some point in your life, is that the dome itself seems detached from the rest of the architecture. It almost seems to hover in space up above you. And the Greek, or the Romans really like to mess around with um, with their architecture in such a way as to put the, the viewer off center, put the, the person who walked into these spaces a little bit off their game, so to speak. So you'd walk into this this interior that's like bigger than anything you've ever seen in your life. And the dome would just seem to float above the rest of the architecture. And it really feels that way. In the center of the dome is what is known as an oculus. An oculus is a round opening, uh, usually at the top of a building, but it can be in the sides as well, uh, which was symbolic of the eye of the god of the sun, Sol Invictus, uh, or um, a, a kind of later manifestation of Apollo, in a way, who is the main god, the progenitor god of all the Roman emperors. So you look up there and it's like gods looking back down at you and it is wide open. Rain comes right through here, lands on the floor and is uh, taken away by various drainage systems here. Back to so if you look at this area of the dome, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about its engineering as well. Um, in this area on each side, and again, it's all created out of concrete. The composite that they put into the cement form here is a heavy kind of gravel. As you move up here, it gets to be a lighter gravel. And right up at the top, they used pumice stone to hold together the concrete, which is really light so that it reduces the amount of weight that's actually putting pressure on the dome itself, which is cool. The other thing that's going on here, if we go back to the interior, is that all of the marble, all of the stone on the floor, in the columns, in inlays all around this, these are stones that they, they pick from different parts of the Roman Empire. Things as far away as Egypt, or Greece, or into France, or North Africa, things that were exotic. And symbolically, what this would signify is the breadth of the Roman Empire, that they control all of these areas. 
So imagine um, Hadrian bringing in a foreign dignitary or a group of foreign dignitaries into this space and how overwhelming it must have seemed as he kind of set them up to treaty with them or to talk to them about what taxes they were going to pay next or whatever his agenda might have been at that time. But the other really famous structure in Rome is the so-called Colosseum, uh, the amphitheater of Rome, uh, which was originally created by Vespasian. He started it anyway, and then it was finished by Nero. Um, the Colosseum here is the first permanent Colosseum, and these things were used, of course, they're giant amphitheaters, used for primarily the, um, the gladiatorial games, a form of entertainment for the ancient Romans. Before this time, they would set up bleachers in the forum, in those big entry spaces, and have basically gladiatorial games there. And then Vespasian realized that one of the ways to placate um, the Roman people was to give them forms of entertainment. So he started the construction of this giant forum, which was primarily created out of concrete but all of the concrete was faced with pieces of travertine marble. The, the architectural form, so down here is where Vespasian really got going. The bottom form, these are all based upon the orders of architecture that came from classical Greece and then were adopted by the Romans. I don't need you to remember this, but it, it's worth noting that at the bottom, the, the engaged columns, as they're called, because they don't they don't stand free, they're engaged with the wall, are called Tuscan columns. They're basically a Doric column with a base on the bottom of it. And then you go up one level and you get an Ionic column up here. And then you go up another level and you get a Corinthian column up here. And then at the top you get flat columns, which are called um, pilasters, that are engaged as well, that are a composite form. Now, the um, we'll move inside here. Or, or a reconstruction. This is what it would have looked like originally with all of its facing. It had giant medallions up at the top, probably made out of bronze with various victory battles, um, sculptures of great leaders, as well as probably um, gods and, and so forth in all of these entryways, all of these Roman arches, of which there are 80 of them all radiating inwards, which is really hard to do at this time, of course. But up as your reading kind of tells you about the importance of this and the Arch of Constantine in relation to other major monuments created by Nero, the Sol Invictus um, sculpture here, a symbol of the primacy of the emperor, among other things, his attachment to the God of the Sun. And it gives you some sense of scale here. If you look at it, a gigantic form. Let me just give you some of the dimensions here. The, Pantheon is 159 feet tall. It's about 616 feet long and 511 feet wide. So it's kind of an ovoid shape. It can hold, or at least originally it could hold, it had wooden um, benches on the inside or, or wooden kind of stadium seating on the inside. Somewhere between 45 to 50,000 people, uh, the cheap seats were at the top and the expensive seats were down at the bottom, just like contemporary stadia. By the way, um, the floor of the uh, Colosseums, all of them, all of the amphitheaters was lined with sand, probably to soak up the blood. And the uh, Latin word for sand is arena, which is where we get the term arena for our sport, sports stadiums. That looking at it from the top, um, this area that's wide open here at the bottom, this oval area, is basically the area that was covered with wood across the top of this. These were storage areas and places for animals to be held and gladiators to wait to fight. Um, and over the top of that was sand placed on it. Uh, and then in all of these areas were wooden seating uh, so that you can sit in here and uh, and see the entire spectacle of this. When it was first uh, finished by Nero, uh, the first hundred days of opening, he held gladiatorial games every single day. And estimates have it that about 9,000 animals were killed in these mock battles and hunts between various animals 
things as exotic as as lions and tigers taken out of uh, various parts of the Roman Empire to just hunting for deers and so forth. Uh, and about 2,000 gladiators who were captured soldiers and slaves and criminals, uh, as well as professional fighters who were forced to fight each other to the death um, for the entertainment of of the masses. You can see it's a very militaristic culture, and so the idea of their sport is battle to the death rather than battle until someone gives in, although that was a component part of some of these. You could, if someone fought very well and, and yet was defeated, um, sometimes the crowd was asked whether that person's life should be spared here. Uh, again, and just a little bit of how this is constructed, very wide at the base and then slowly but surely kind of angling in. Uh, many contemporary stadiums use the same kind of building methods that they use here in these times. And then to get a sense again of the scale and what it looks like today, you can walk across the middle. This would have all been covered by wood. And these are all storage areas. And then over the top of the sand place, there are rumors, although many um, Historians these days believe them to be, let's say, partially true that you could flood the entire Colosseum so as to create mock naval battles. These days, historians think maybe you could put, uh, you know, about 12 inches of water in here um, to do something kind of like a, a little celebratory mock battle, but nothing like the, the grand ideas of filling the whole space up as if it is a giant pond. Just a few of the mosaics um, that show gladiatorial games. Mosaics are, we see these, uh, I think we've seen these before. They're, they're basically um, illustrations made out of small pieces of glass or ceramic tile uh, in order to give the color to the figurative forms here and they last a long time. They're, they're used on walls or on floors and this just shows you some of these scenes. So gladiators finding each other at the top while music, musicians play on. Gladiators finding each other in the middle. People hunting, uh, looks like a, a leopard here or deer over here or hunting more animals or animals hunting or fighting each other down here at the bottom. And just a couple more scenes of this, showing you what's up of those mosaic. One of the favorite forms of the, of the Greeks and the Romans use mosaics uh, in order to decorate walls and so forth. Just very briefly, I don't want to go into this in great detail. There's more about this in the text with all of the kinds of ins and outs of this. But um, one of the things that changes um, in the time of Tiberius after Vespasian, and I know it's hard to keep all these names clear, so it's, it's really not that important, but think of this as the run up to Constantine the Great, is that the Roman Empire uh, and Diocletian in particular, who wants to rule very very strictly, very, very authoritarianly. And Diocletian, by the way, is one of the ones who, um, you know, has a lot of problems with Christians who are rising uh, in the Roman Empire at this time. Uh, in order to protect the Roman Empire, it splits the Roman Empire's politics into four different quadrants that are represented by what you see here, the four uh, tetrarchs. Um, the tetrarchs, Again, you don't need to know the ins and outs of the, the kind of system of leadership, but the tetrarchs are a position and they're divided into four parts so that you couldn't take over one and take over all of Rome. The tetrarchs then had Caesars who, um, who basically administered to their affairs for them. Um, and this lasts for, you know, 60 or 70 years or so before Constantine takes over and a stand, uh, basically kind of modifies the system into a two place or two venue Roman rule, one in Rome and the other over in Constantinople, which is modern day Istanbul in Turkey, which is why the Byzantine Empire really gets going. It's because he moves one of the seats of power of the Roman Empire out of Rome so as to protect Rome because it's too easy to attack one area. And after all, the, the Roman generals are taking over the empire over and over again. One rises to power and he displaces another one. So the idea was to make these different seats of power, the tetrarchs, which you see here. And 
the big reason to bring this up is to say that these symbolize an office. And so the facial types now become schematic and really simple. And this kind of simplicity with wide open eyes and simple faces is going to be something adopted by Byzantine culture later on. Um, they are um, you know, made out of a particular stone porphyry. This one's in Venice on the edge of a uh, what is now a Christian uh, cathedral. Uh, but the idea of individualism has been taken out of this equation because these are supposed to represent a position, an office. Uh, on their on their heads here, so Diocletian starts this. He puts into position these tetrarchs and a whole kind of system of government based upon tetrarchs are in the top, then Augusti are right below that, then Caesar's administered to them, and you know kind of changes the way that Rome is ruled. One symbol of their uh, of their position here is the hat they're wearing, which is called the Pannonian cap which is a symbol of the power of the tetrarch. Now remember this kind of schematic face because it goes up in the work of Constantine. Constantine the Great comes after the, this time of the tetrarchs and you know it, it's, it's an uneven rule. Um, the Roman generals absolutely still want to take over power and so, um, and so in this case, Constantine the Great does. Constantine the Great is best known for being the Roman emperor who adopted Christianity, although it should be said that his mother adopted Christianity, uh, but he was a little bit non-committal on the subject. He certainly uh, admired Christianity. He very well may have practiced Christianity himself. After all, by this point, the Roman Empire had over two million followers of Christianity. And we'll come back to that story when we look at early Christian art. Uh, and so it was kind of a, a political decision for him to placate this huge mass of people who were caught up in this fairly new religion by adopting their religion, or at least, um, you know, not persecuting them. And he actually established the so-called Edict of Milan that uh, stopped the persecution of any Christians, which had really got going under Diocletian. What you're looking at here is the head of Constantine. He, he ruled in the early um, fourth century CE. This is from around 325 to 326 or so uh, CE. That was part of a much bigger sculpture. This is a gigantic head. And I just put off to the side the coinage of Constantine to show you what he probably more likely looked like over here. That, um, when it was just in kind of uh, the way that it's displayed these days or for a while, these are all sculpture casts of it. And this is where it originally was housed in its own forum, where you see it over here on the side. The head is mammoth, a giant piece of marble. The body was marble, but it was draped with pieces of uh, precious metals, bronzes, golds, uh, and so forth. And he sat there at the end of the hall in judgment, again, administered to by people. You see the scale here. These are the size of people. And this is this mom, mammoth colossal sculpture of Constantine the Great. So what's Constantine's story? Why did he adopt Christianity? Well, at the time that he takes power, uh, Rome is in a little bit of disarray, of course, and two emperors or potential emperors are vying for power. Um, Maxim and uh, Constantine have this famous battle at the Milvian Bridge, which is on its way into Rome, and uh, Constantine, in the end, wins that battle. Now, the reason that he wins this battle, according to Constantine, is that um, he uh, has a, before the battle happens, um, before he goes against Maxentius, he has this vision, supposedly, of a, a flaming cross. He sees this flaming cross and hears the words, in this sign you shall conquer. And he asks all of his flag bearers to put this flaming cross on their, on their flags. Now, clearly, this is symbolic of Christianity, and it's not 
it's not surprising that they put this on their banners, they put it on their shields, and then they inscribe on this the, the Greek letters Chi Rho or XP, which are the monogram of Christ. It literally means Christus, as we'll see in Christian times. And he goes into this battle against Maxentius, and he wins that battle and dedicates this all to this, you know, this deity, although he doesn't exactly adopt Christianity. I think we can see the writing on the wall here. He ends the persecution of Christians. He, um, he recognizes Christianity as a lawful religion. He issues the so-called Edict of Milan, uh, which uh, makes it the law of the land to be tolerant of Christians. Um, and, uh, and yet, you know, he doesn't adopt it entirely himself. The major extant architecture or monument to Constantine is the Arch of Constantine, which you see here, which is, you know, three times as big as the Arch of, of Titus that you saw originally. It's got three arches. It was originally placed, let's see if I brought this in, it was originally placed so that you could see the sun god through the, um, the archway of this, uh, the Colosseum is in the background. You've got a reading that will kind of alert you to the importance symbolically of this kind of sighting of the Arch of Constantine. What's really interesting about this, though, so here's one side of it. On one side, you see at the top the inscription, which I'll show you and read to you in a moment. And up here, you have all of these sculptures in here as well. But almost all these sculptures were robbed off of other sculptural monuments, the forums and other arches of the time. Um, this is something that's known as spolia in Roman times. Spolia, or spoils, uh, was a practice that was used by all of the Roman emperors. They would take sculpture off of other monuments and put it on their own. And usually this was done to show an allegiance to an earlier ruler. And that's probably what's being done here to say, I come from this great line of rulers. That's why I'm using their stuff. But the other reason is that, you know, at this point, Rome is, is kind of at a, a critical end. They're not, they don't have a ton of money. And it may have been just a matter of practicalities to not spend a ton on this monument to take parts from other monuments. The entire interior is all... Um, cement, so that's cheap, and then just facing it is the only thing that costs a lot. You see on the exterior of this, again, the engaged columns, um, sculptures down below it, and then these various these various sculptures in between. I'll, I'll point out the major one, the other side of this. So the inscription goes, to the emperor Caesus Flavius, Flavius Constantine Maximus, Pius Felix Augustus, which means uh, head leader uh, and leader of religion. The Senate and the Roman people, since through divine inspiration and great wisdom, he has delivered the state from the tyrant and his party by his army and noble arms. Dedicate this arch decorated with triumphal insignia. So this is one of the additions. This is one of the things that was actually sculpted for the Arch of Constantine instead of being taken from another monument. You can probably tell by looking at the faces here, they're very schematic. They look suspiciously like those tetrarchs, which was the new style of the age, a very severe style, and the idea that there's just an office that is being held by a great leader. This is a scene in which they're leaving Milan in order to um, go off into battle against Maxentius. Um, this is a scene, one of the scenes of their victory. There are a couple of these over one of the triumphal arches itself with a god kind of paying homage to this victory as they go against the, um, against Maxentius. It's the actual victory itself. I don't think you can see this very well, but this is all supposed to be water. So it's the Milvian Bridge that they're battling on. These two rondelles, these giant kind of medallion forms up here above, have been lifted off earlier sculptures and represent the triumph of Hercules, of all people. Um, Hercules, of course, the greatest of all Greek heroes. And here he is uh, defeating the Nemean lion, I think, over here. Another um, 
created specifically for this monument sculpture is this one that you don't see Constantine here because his head has been carved off. Someone who didn't like him much, you know, came at this and whacked his head off. But this would have been him in the center, standing at a rostrum. This is, a, again, an elevated platform addressing uh, the masses and everyone you can see in attendance is paying attention to the words of the great uh, leader here. There are also other great leaders that are included on this on each side um, who are no longer alive, but they've been included here as if to say, I too, um, you know, dedicate myself to Constantine the Great. That seems, you know, one of those same scenes from below. Above him on another rostrum, addressing the crowd now in kind of like um, turned into a god sitting on a throne with um, leaders around him paying homage to him. Just a couple. These are on, honestly on the art of Constantine, the things that were lifted off earlier sculptures seem to me to be much cooler. This is probably Hercules again uh, slaying the, I forget, the Scythian boar. And overall look of this as it would have existed in relation to the other buildings around it. For today, just very briefly, I, I wanted to point out, I'm not going to go into any detail about this, um, that the Romans really loved painting to mural painting and, and forms of fresco painting as well, um, much of which is preserved in two cities that were buried under ash, uh, Pompeii and, um, and Herculaneum. And so when we went in and, and studied these areas, we found all these great paintings, although we're not entirely sure what they mean. This is the so-called Villa of the Mysteries in um, Pompeii. It was created somewhere in the first century BCE. And you see here a number of what we take to be gods and probably ritual performers as well as initiates. The main god seems to be Bacchus who is the god of wine and the god of revelry. He's the Roman manifestation of the Greek god Dionysus here, uh, who was also understood to reveal many mysteries in the universe. And if we look at a couple of these up close, he is figures in various states of undress. It's not clear whether they are initiates, which is one of the interpretations, that these were young women uh, approaching um, sexual maturity who are going through the rites of uh, Bacchus here, either to become priestesses for Bacchus or to ensure their own fertility, attended by um, priests or goddesses on each side with these wings. They're just super cool, very odd paintings. And you can see up above the meander form taken out of Greek um, forms of decoration. One final one, again, just to show you what these things look like. Um, very accurate, very detailed, um, but in the end, entirely mysterious paintings whose meaning is still up for grabs for a lot of people. This is probably Bacchus, um, and the reason we think that is if he looks like he is wasted, it's because he probably is. Bacchus is the god of wine and revelry, and here he is kind of drunk and falling into another figure who's, you know, the painting has been destroyed, so we're not quite clear on who that would be. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this short lecture on the Roman uh, art of the Roman Empire and Roman Republican times, and I will see you all next week.